Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today we're going to talk about what Kerbal Space Program doesn't teach you about rocket fuel injectors. So rocket fuel injectors are a critical part of rocket engines where propellants are fed into the combustion chamber. These are hidden away in the heart of the engine. And in many cases, when I'm looking at real engines, there are security people there that are telling me, please don't photograph these because they are actually protected under ITAR and various other export regulations. Now, of course, we know a lot about older engines and in many cases we know what the newer engines are using, but we don't know the exact measurements that for the injector. So we can't you know, figure out the exact performance or derive our own engine from them. Good propellant injectors can make all the difference between your engine performing excellently and it exploding due to combustion instability. Their task is to take the propellants and ensure that they are distributed and mixed well enough that the combustion is as complete as possible before the exhaust escapes out the throat and the nozzle of the engine. This is measured in something called combustion efficiency. You want this to be as high as possible, otherwise you are literally losing performance out the back of the nozzle. On most rocket engines, the propellants are supplied as liquids. The injectors spray these into the combustion chamber, making tiny drops. And you might imagine that this is like a showerhead, but a showerhead is a poor design, even ignoring the fact that your average showerhead wouldn't survive very long in a combustion chamber of a rocket. But showerheads are a good starting point for understanding how injectors work. On one side you have a high pressure liquid going into a manifold and a lot of small holes where the fluid flows out. The narrow holes result in an increase in fluid velocity and a drop in its pressure. The jets of liquid then break up into small drops and these mix in the combustion chamber and burn quickly. So the primary goal of the injector is to maximize the surface area to mass ratio of your propellant. The process of breaking down the propellant into small droplets is generally referred to as atomization. The other primary goal of a fuel injector is to ensure that the fuel and the oxidizer get well mixed. Otherwise, you can create a fine spray of fuel drops, but they won't burn unless they mix with a fine spray of oxidizer drops. So fuel and oxidizer jets also need to get placed so that they mix well with each other. If an injector design doesn't produce small enough drops or the mixing isn't particularly good, then the combustion efficiency won't be as high. One way to compensate is to make your combustion chamber bigger, but then of course you add more mass to your engine and you lose performance also because you have to then flow your cooling fluid through a larger volume. So showerhead style injectors were used in early rockets, but they don't generate great atomization or mixing. However, they are relatively easy to make and lots of amateur rockets actually will start out with those in their engines. In fact, I've heard legends of amateur rockets using actual shower heads they bought from the store. The problem with the simple jets from a shower head is that they go in a straight line without much spread until they hit something. So they rely on turbulence in the combustion chamber to drive the mixing process. So many rocket designs improve on the shower head by using impinging injectors. That is, the propellant jets are angled so that they collide with each other. The colliding jets scatter the liquid over a wider angle and create much smaller droplets, so that they offer a significant improvement in both atomization and mixing. The primary disadvantage is that you need to drill all your injector holes with much higher accuracy because messing up one will mean the jets don't impinge and you lose a lot of performance and that means pretty much throwing away your entire injector assembly. There are a whole host of impinging jet injectors. Designers can choose to vary the number of jets involved and they can also choose to match uh, jets to a single propellant or they can mix and match them. If you've got two, in, if you've got jets that are all the same type, those are called like. If you're firing fuel into oxidizer, that's called an unlike impinging injector. So the most simple is the like doublet, where you have two jets of the same propellant, they meet and they produce a spray that fans out across a wide angle. So it delivers good atomization and spreads out the propellant. But the mixing still happens downstream from the injection. So this design was used in a lot of classic rockets. It was used in Atlas, Thor, uh, Titan, and the Saturn V. 
Because the jets are all the same, it was very easy to design the manifold to deliver the propellant to both of the jets. The F1 propellant injectors on the Saturn V are probably the most famous propellant injectors in rocket history, partly on account of the problems they had where the engines would explode due to combustion instability. Uh, but this problem was really more to do with the size of the combustion chamber rather than the fact that they were choosing these uh, impinging injectors. We have some great photos of the uh, injector plates showing all the pairs of the orifices in the injector system, along with the baffles that they had to add to suppress the combustion instability. On the final design, there were 1,428 oxidizer orifices and 1,404 fuel orifices all paired up into doublets. And you can imagine that this takes a very long time to make. You can also see that some pairs are larger than others because in the engine, you have more liquid oxygen than liquid kerosene. So you have the oxygen holes are larger. You can see from this photo that they also experimented with triplets where there would be a third orifice added in the middle. And this changes the spread of the droplets and various other parameters, but I don't think it provided any real benefits to justify the extra 1400 holes that they would have to drill in the injector plate. Moving on, there is a much greater variety of unlike impinging injectors. You can have a simple doublet where the fuel and the oxidizer jets intersect. And this gives atomization that starts the mixing right at the injector. But the fuel and oxidizer are, end up somewhat segregated because the fuel will tend to bounce in, the, in one direction and the oxidizer in the other. Um, also, because the mass of the fuel and the ox oxidizer are generally different, your spray will tend to go off at one angle or another. And you know, of course, designers have to accommodate for that. So there is an improvement, which is the unlike triplet, where you have one propellant jet in the center of one type or the other, and then on the outside, you have the other propellant in a pair impinging on the center. And this is an improvement because your uh, spray pattern is now symmetrical and your mixing is good. I believe this was used on the XLR81, which is the engine on the upper stage, the Agena upper stage. And I've also seen photos of the Lunar Module Ascent Engine injector that looks like it uses triplets too. Somewhat more common though is the unlike quadlet. And this has four jets meeting at a point. So you've got fuel coming in on one side and then at 90 degrees you'll have a pair of oxidizer and they all meet at the same point. So this produces um, another you know, nice symmetric spray pattern. Uh, it's more like a cone rather than a fan that you get from the linear injectors. Uh, so this design was used on the LR87 engine, which was of course the uh, system for the Titan rockets. And you know, if you really want, you can make a pentad where you add an extra jet in the middle. But you know, the more holes you drill, the harder to build these things it is to build these things. And the truth is that these uh, impinging jet injectors have sort of faded out over time. Now. Also, in most of the examples I've uh, mentioned, the I've talked about propellant plates being on the top of the engine blowing down. It's also possible to have your injectors along the side. And if you remember when I was at ESA, they, I looked at the Viking engine on the Ariane 1 through 4, and that had the propellant injecting through the side. So that's another way to do things. Also, while I'm, I remember, I've talked about main combustion engines, but you're also going to need injector systems for your pre-burners and your gas generators. And of course, those will have much more oxidizer or much more uh, fuel, depending upon whether, how, you know, how, whether you're fuel rich or oxidizer rich. And early on in the 1940s and 50s, there was another type of jet injector, which was somewhat popular. This was called a splash plate injector, where you would have your fuel in your oxidizer jets and they would meet at a point and you would also have a hard plate. So it would scatter off that and splash off at an angle. And I guess those fell out of favor. They kind of make remind me of sprinkler systems in buildings to you know, extinguish fires. So the other major class of injectors, which are actually more common today than the jet types, are sheet or spray type injectors. And these produce conical sheets, which then spread out and they separate into the droplets. And a very early example of this is the simple swirl type injector. And these just, the fluid flows into the base at an angle and then they swirl around and then 
spray out. And because the fluid is spinning, when it emerges from the hole, it spreads out. Uh, and these were actually used in the V2. The V2 was a very interesting uh, rocket because they were obviously trying to solve the problems. Instead of having an injector plate at the top of the engine, they had these sort of cups or warts that were stuck onto the top of the combustion chamber. And they would have like a shower head at the top and then spray uh, swirler types injecting in on the sides. And of course that would then mix and go into the engine. They were obviously trying to figure this all out back then. It's not a great design, but it's interesting to see how they did it back then. Now it's much more common these days to see the swirl mechanism used in concentric tube injectors. So a concentric tube injector has one uh, propellant flowing up a tube in the middle, and then you have a concentric pipe, basically the fluid flows through an annulus, and you know they flow into the engine. And, um, this doesn't provide, on its own, doesn't provide a great way of mixing if there's no swirl because the things kind of flow with no expansion. It does kind of work if you've got, say, hydrogen and oxygen because the speed of sound or the, the speed of flow is different by a factor of 10. But for, you know, fluids which are more consistent in their mass, you need to make that central one expand outwards by swirling it so that it collides with the other propellant. And so you've got coaxial swirl injectors and this design is being used by Copenhagen suborbitals and they actually sent me some fine video examples of this. So yeah you have the one prop a propellant jacket which is produces a conical shape sorry a, a cylindrical shape in the core you produce the conical shape they collide and they mix and they atomize simultaneously and these are very popular these days because they're kind of quite easy to manufacture compared to say drilling all the holes in a, an injector plate and they provide really good mixing and performance. However, the coaxial design you've probably heard mentioned by rocket nerds is the Pintel injector. Instead of swirling what you have is a structure at the top such as an inverted cone where the propellant flows up into it and then pushed out sideways. Um, so this is very, this is actually very popular because you can adjust this pintle up and down uh, and you can do this on two levels. So you can adjust the geometry of your injector while you're changing your throttle on your engine. So this inherently lends itself to throttleable engines. And the first really good example of a pintle injector is the Apollo descent engine, which of course needed to throttle all the way down to 10%. The other really good example of a Pintle injector is the Merlin engine on the Falcon 9. Both of these engines, by the way, they're fed by a single injector assembly. Whereas when I've talked about, it's also possible to have large numbers of Pintles or large numbers of swirl injectors. It's really down to the designer. So the, yeah, the great thing is you can adjust the geometry of this by pulling it out. And with the correct design, you can actually use this as a valve. So you could close up your injectors and close the valve simultaneously. And this means that you don't have to worry about uh, fluid or fuel or propellant in the pipes flowing into your engine after you've shut them down, which is of course really good if you're trying to land a rocket. It means you can start up and shut down very quickly. So this is basically closing off the fuel flow at the injector face or face shut off, which is a phrase you might have heard. One disadvantage of using the single large pintle injector that uh, SpaceX encountered was that they wanted to use an ablative combustion chamber, but because the propellant comes out in a cone, it was hitting the walls and producing a hot spot all the way around that would inevitably burn through, which was what gave them the impetus to switch their Merlins over to regeneratively cooled combustion chambers. And to be clear, whatever kind of injector element you're using, you need to ensure that the propellant is distributed in such a manner that the engine doesn't have hot spots or the sections where the fuel isn't mixed in. Uh, all these cases about, they can have uh, cases where this doesn't work. It is common though, to take advantage of this, of the geometry and have say, fuel injectors along the edges so that you create a fuel rich you know, layer around the outside to protect the walls. That's of course film cooling. Okay, we're almost there. 
So far, I've only discussed injectors where both propellants are in liquid form, but sometimes one or more of your propellants has is a gas. And gases are actually easier in many ways. I mean, if you think about it, the reason why we are wanting the fuel in tiny drops is so that they evaporate into a gas faster. So for the RL10, the expander cycle means that the hydrogen arrives in the at the injector as a gas. So a coaxial injector is used with the oxygen in the middle and the hydrogen flowing rapidly around the outside. And it's the speed difference between the oxygen and the hydrogen which really drives the mixing. More recent RL10s, they added a swirl to the oxygen flow. The Space Shuttle main engine, they use a coaxial swirl system with the oxygen flowing down the middle. But the central pipes used for the oxygen are also heated by the hot hydrogen-rich exhaust from the pre-burners, which means that your hot oxygen is coming into the chamber warmed up and you know, more readily turning itself into a gas. And if you want to know a bit more about this injector, you should t watch my video on STS-93 explaining how a gold bullet almost destroyed a space shuttle. Finally, we don't know very much about the Raptor engine, but we do know that it's a full flow staged combustion cycle engine, which means the propellants that have come out of both the pre-burners are all gas. And according to Elon Musk, they've, they're going to use a large number of coaxial swirl injectors to make sure that the fuel is mixed correctly, which is pretty cool because you've got Copenhagen, Suborbital and SpaceX both using this uh, concept, which just shows this is the injector that everyone's loving these days. So at this point, I hope you've learned that there is a ton of engineering and science that's been applied to the problem of injecting those propellants into the engines. Of course, there are probably a bunch of you out there who are already writing comments explaining what I got wrong or what I missed. And honestly, I look forward to learning more about the subject from you all. It's not a simple problem either. Indeed, computational tools haven't come close to solving all the problems. And sometimes when you think you have the best solution, it can be off limits because it's just too complicated to actually build it reliably. That's where rocket science realizes that it has to work within rocket engineering. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.